Okay, we've got another equilibrium situation here, and from the information they're giving, I have a feeling we're going to need an ice table. Let's see what happens. They say that carbon dioxides can break down into carbon monoxides and molecular oxygen, and that reaction has a delta H of plus 566, from which I meet, I just take that it is endothermic. So we can say heat goes on the left, heat is a reactant, it's one of the things you have to put in to make this reaction go. For Le Chatelier principle stuff, we don't particularly care how much heat, just that the heat is on the left, so it's something, it's a reactant. Now, let's put in our initial change in equilibrium rows, and we'll see if we can get this thing organized. Four moles of CO2, and I hope your first reaction was, that's not a concentration, I can't be sure about that number yet, but then, oh, we can because they gave us a one liter flask, hooray. So the concentration of CO2 is four divided by one. So they put that in the flask. They don't mention putting anything else in the flask, so I take it there were no products before the reaction began. So we start with 400. And I'm not going to track the amount of heat. Heat does not... I mean, you could track kilojoules, but I don't think that's going to come up, so I'm just going to focus on the concentrations here. I have never seen an ice table that used heat, even though theoretically you could. You'd have to measure energy content total energy in the system before and after, which is difficult to do. So I don't think you will ever see that. So don't worry about this column. I put heat there and it makes it look like that should be part of the ice table, but it's not going to be. What do they have here? Measurements taken at equilibrium. Okay, so we're it, the information we're getting now is about the E row, indicated that one mole of carbon dioxide remained. One divided by one means our concentration is down to one mole per liter. Okay. Do you see how we get started with this? Always look for a column where you know two of the three things. That's an easy place to start. We started with four moles of CO2, moles per liter of CO2. We dropped down to one. Apparently we lost three. Now, the ratio of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide is 2 to 2, meaning those numbers always match. So this is also a 3. The ratio here is 1 to 2, so the oxygen is always half as great as the other two numbers, so that would make this a 1.5. And now that we have that, we started with no carbon monoxide. We made 3 moles per liter of it. We're up to 3. We started with no oxygen. We made 1.5 moles per liter. We're up to 1.5. And they want the equilibrium constant, so we have to work out a K. Well, the equilibrium law for this thing would be products over reactants, so we get carbon monoxide squared times oxygen divided by carbon dioxide also squared. If we feed numbers into that, the carbon monoxide is 3. Remember to square it. Oxygen's 1.5. And, and carbon dioxide is 1. And technically we should square that, although squaring 1's is a little pointless. Uh, 3 squared is 9. 1.5 times 9 is 13.5. Divided by 1 is 13.5. And all of our data had three significant digits, so 13.5 is an appropriate format for the K. All right, now what? Hydrogen chloride. It's not aqueous, so don't call it hydrochloric acid yet. This is a gas. If it touched water, it would quickly dissolve into hydrochloric acid. So this is a gas that, if it touches your skin or any moisture on your body, it'll turn into acid. That's not a real friendly attribute for a gas, but it's not acid just yet. There's a reaction. We have initial change equilibrium. And the equilibrium constant is 2 times 10 to the minus 2, which is 0 0.5. 
0.02. Less than 1, so these chemicals do not react very much. HCl does not generally break down into hydrogen and chlorine, but it can a little bit. One liter flask, that's nice, means our concentrations are going to be easy. A certain amount of HCl, they're not saying how much, let's call it X, was put in a one liter flask. They don't mention any hydrogen or chlorine, so we'll assume there were none to begin with. How many moles of hydrogen chloride are placed in the flask to produce 0 0.6 moles of chlorine at equilibrium? A chlorine amount is 0 0.6. What do you say? How do we get going on this? This column where we know two out of the three values is a great place to start. We had no chlorine. We ended up with 0.6 of chlorine. Apparently we made 0.6. Hydrogen and chlorine are always produced in equal amounts, one-to-one -one ratio. So if chlorine is 0.6, hydrogen is also 0.6. The hydrogen chloride must be twice as great as the other two because of its coefficient of 2. So twice as big as 0 0.6 is 1.2. And now we can fill in our bottom row. Start with 0, gain 0 0.6. Of course you are at 0 0.6. Start with x, lose 1.2, and... That's not a beautiful expression, but it'll have to do. All right, so we have equilibrium amounts for everything, and we know our equilibrium constant. We should be able to do something with that. Write your K. Our products are hydrogen and chlorine. Our reactant is hydrogen chloride. It had a coefficient of 2, so power of 2 down here. <clears throat> and if we put numbers into that, hydrogen 0 0.6. Chlorine is also 0 0.6, so I'm going to keep this compact and just write squared. Hydrogen chloride is x minus 1.2, also squared because it says power of 2 right here. And we know our k comes out to 0 0.02. So can we solve that for k? Yes. Yes, we can. What, how do we start here? Do you remember what we do to clean up an expression like this? When everything on one side is squared, it's a very good option to throw a square root at it. This square root will strip the squares off of both of these. That square root goes, that square cancels, that square cancels, so we've completely unsquared our left side, which is nice. That gets us 0 0.6, not squared anymore, over x minus 1.2, also not squared anymore. Now, the bad news is on the right side, we really do have to square root this. 0 0.02 squared, or sorry, square root, is 0 0.1414. Okay. If we want to get this x out of the denominator, the way you do that is multiply both sides by it. So on the left side, we'll multiply by x minus 1.2. On the right side, we'll multiply by x minus 1.2. On the left side, the x minus 1.2s cancel out. Leaving us with 0 0.6 and nothing else on the left-hand side. On the right side, we have 0 0.1414. When it's multiplying by a bracket like this, it means it distributes through. It's going to multiply the x and also the negative 1.2. So 0.1414 times x is easy. You just write 0 0.1414x. Multiplying the numbers, you get 0.1414 times 1.2, 0 0.16968. 9, 6, 8. Okay. Uh, what you do next with an equation like this is called segregating it, which means get all, the, get all the terms that have just x on one side and all the terms that don't have x on the other side. So we can leave this x where it is. We'll take this number to the other side where it will become positive. Or you can think of it as we add 0 0.16968 to, to each side so that this cancels and we get a 0 0.16968 on the left. The effect of that is we get 0 
76968. That's the effect of adding these two together. Equals 0.1414x. And finally, to get x by itself, we divide it by 0 0.1414. If we do that on both sides, 0 0.1414, not x, we're just dividing by the number because we want it to cancel out. That'll leave the x by itself. So we do this. The 0.1414s cancel out. And we end up with 0.76968 divided by 0.1414 is 5.4434. Four, four, three equals x. Now, significant digits, everything they gave us up here had three significant digits, including the k, so that's actually a tad too long. We should trim it down to 5.44.